And we are live. <laughs> hey, uh-huh. hey, everybody. Welcome to SVT time. It is Thursday. It's 2 o'clock on the East Coast. It's 11 o'clock on the West Coast. And I don't know what time it is in the middle of the country, but you'll figure it out. <laughs> Welcome. Um, I've got two special guests today, actually. Uh, Haji is joining me today as my co-host. Um, Dom is, uh, I don't know where Dom is. He's on vacation somewhere. He's always on vacation. Uh, but anyways, we're lucky to have Haji here. Um, for those of you that that watch SVT time, Haji is the guy that he's usually behind the scenes answering people's questions under the Ampeg logo. So he, you guys are familiar with Haji. And for our special guest today, we have Chris Weiss joining us, rejoining us from a previous episode. And um, Chris, what's going on, brother? What's going on? Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we had a bad signal last time, but it looks like I'm doing quite well with the signal now. It looks really good. So thank yeah. goodness the technology <laughs> these days can be a little complicated. Right. Right. Um, I received a uh, rocket base that I have upstairs uh, combo, the uh, 112. Yeah. And... Uh, I love how light that thing is. Uh, just I can move it around the house from room to room depending on my vibe, and <laughs> it's got a great look and sound for a little amp. Yeah. Uh, it's been really helpful to have something. I just move it around room to room and mess around and uh, try and get little videos. I'll, I'll post some things for you soon with that. Sure. Cool. Yeah. Um, kind of. My environment's been changing a lot, so I've been trying kind of different rooms and things and seeing how. Uh, how it looks and sounds. Cool. Try, I know. Try, trying to catch up with everyone else on the social media front, you know. Right. I know. I, I know. Been doing it much. Are you in your Are you in your home studio right now? You're calling calling in from your home. Yeah, studio? this is a live room, which is great. That 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 means you know it's soundproofed and uh, the neighbors don't complain. It's a wonderful room. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I have my what I consider my home rig here behind me, which is the. Um, the VR 100 watt uh, yep. head and the 212 combos. I have two 212s. Um, and I, I've been messing around with a lot of stuff on my solo record and utilizing the tweeter because I'm doing a lot of two hand tapping and, and uh, soloing, actually. Okay. Uh, it's a pretty high difficulty level where I really hash it out before I show up in the studio to record, you know, and be uh, well rehearsed. I've been getting different things lately because of the solo aspect. And uh, usually I turn the tweeter off, but now lately for the tapping, I'm using an active uh, elite Fender bass behind me there. I'm getting different things for the oh, sake yeah. of tapping, you know. Do you yeah. do you utilize the uh, tweeter much on your amps uh, when you have a tweeter? Um, you know, it, I use that same exact setup, the V4 with the 212 ring and uh, mm -hmm. uh, with the 212 cab. And yeah, I do. You know what? I do turn the horn on, but mm -hmm. um, like most guys, like I'll turn the horn on, but I don't use the ultra high and I kind of have my treble kind of rolled back a little bit. So it's not like overbearing. It just kind of adds a little bit of crispness to the signal. Yeah. It's nice for chords and stuff like that. If I'm getting aggressive, I tend to step away from my top end a little more. And yeah. the tweeter, and uh, just because I don't want it to be too clicky and obnoxious like that, I don't, I don't care. Now this is this is a huge departure from you because, I mean, ever since I've known you, you've been kind of like a passive P bass. Yeah, you know, like that. Uh, that was your thing was passive P bass. You know, old, I don't want to say old school because your playing certainly isn't old school, but your sound well, is very passive. Yeah. Well, I, the, the thing is, the fundamentals of the sound uh in the studio versus live i think i'm gonna go right you know when i go out there live again i'm always gonna have my old p bases that are passive with the big svts which are in storage right now yep. um you know and, and with ace i had six of them up there remember that wall that, that was just unbelievable you know uh I remember when i yeah i did a, i did about a four-year stint with ace fraley and i remember uh uh I was in the cult for 10 years, ended up joining Ace's band because he got real busy around the time. And I said, hey, Ace, what are we going to do for the stage? Like, what, what do you want for stage? Like, with the SBTs or whatever. And he said, oh, 
I'm gonna need six. And I was like, whoa, six <laughs> SDTs, you know. Um, usually I just had one on because right. that's actually plenty. I, I don't, I, you know, unless you like it spread out a bit or something, but uh, that was incredible. And I will go back to that live for the bigger shows, but I think when I'm doing my solo stuff, I'm entertaining more of the tonal qualities at the top end of the bass. Sure. And uh, it's it's necessary for some of those bell like tones to come out with the two hand tapping, which if people want to check it out, I'm working on it still. Uh, it's at chriswise.com. Yep. And um, I got some amazing art. This guy, Russell Marks, has been doing this artwork for me, which collaborates a, a bit with the story I'm writing for the record and sort of like uh, creating a comic concept which I'm hoping to get done. It's a huge project um, and Russell's been busy doing a book. So uh, I'm definitely going to release some shape or form of that comic yeah. slash music, which is super theatrical and should really take you on a fantasy goth kind of vampiric fantasy kind of journey, which I think a lot of people would enjoy right now. Like just escape. There's no, there's no topic matters in there that should rally up except for just basic, um, you know, fear and horror, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm dabbling with the goth side of it, you know, but well, have a lot know, of fun. It, it's, you know, I know we talked about this before with your, with the artwork with Russell Mar. it's Russell Marks, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if anybody's not familiar with Russell Marks, go check out his work because it is, I mean, my, my daughter is a tattoo artist and, and I know she's been heavily inspired by a lot of his work as well. Oh, that's and amazing. Yeah. It's just, I mean, it, and you're, you know, he, I know he's doing stuff for your album and, and, and some of your, it's just, it's beautiful work. So check out Russell Marks as well. And yeah. His, yeah. Well. And his spelling is up there too. It's a uh, two L's, two S's and two L's. Right. So uh, it's all on my website and you can see all the artwork he's done, which is kind of like, there's one song about Jack the Ripper and you see this kind of owl vampire uh, and the detail in the eyes and the blood coming from the, you know, the, the lips and everything is just, it's like, oh my gosh, I want to see this like in a movie already. Yeah. It's so exciting just when you see one. And also the upright bass on fire with the fire internally in it and the spirit inside the upright bass. I mean, these are things he and I worked on a lot, which I developed over the years as a bassist kind of um, thinking about the bow and the aspects of the, the, the theatrical part, even though I'm a real shredder, I'm always playing and I'm never happy with anything. So I'm always trying to get it better. And I'm that guy that sometimes needs to be told we're just doing two takes because you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, Cause I, I always feel like I can do it better, but um, you know, it's, it's uh, this is the kind of music that is not about trying to write a hit song. It's about taking you on a journey, you know? There you go. The visual is part of that. Uh, I remember with the Hollywood vampires, uh, Alice Cooper and I were chatting about the theatrics of it all. And I was talking about the Bo Kane, which I've been, uh, I talked to Ned Steinberger about actually, which he might be a good go-to developer for me. But the Bo Kane being a little longer, that even more longer draw of the bow, but also could look great live because you have like a cane that's a bow. Yeah, he added, he added a wonderful idea, which is so Alice Cooper, which is make sure you have a knife on it. And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Of course. <laughs> yeah. And maybe some smoke. I was I was, I was I was asking Ace, I wonder if I can get a little mini smoker for my bow. Right. <laughs> and while, while I'm playing, I could kind of have the, the smoke coming up off the bow. It should be a great visual, you know, uh, yeah, well, uh, at you the right point. I mean, that's, you know, that, that's the business we're in. We're in the entertainment business. Yeah. You know? And, you know, this going all the way back to, you know, Kiss, New York Dolls, Alice Cooper. I mean, it's part yeah. of it is the visual of it all, yeah. you know? So that'd be cool. That'd be very cool to see. Yeah, I've been working on a lot of really, really kind of um, concept type of stuff. And then, like, I've been really shredding with the bow mainly. Um, cool. Cool. A lot of the hard, a lot of the hardcore classical guys like Rabath and Gary Carr and stuff like that. If you study them at all, oh, they yeah. say there's not, there's nothing but bow. That's yeah. the only thing. And I'm like, wow, you know that that was a rude awakening when I was a kid going to college because I thought I could just play all my Iron Maiden riffs and Geezer Butler riffs on the upright, which was hard as hell. Yep. Or John Paul Jones. I remember working on uh, 
ramble on on the upright bass and being like trying to really get it in tune and stuff and yeah you know yeah. you, you want to put your fist through a wall because you're so frustrated because you normally can do this you know but uh that that's really what got me started on the upright but then i really got into the bow and yeah. uh that's did you start on upright first or did, did you go from upright to electric or electric to upright? I was uh, a, a Steve Harris freak, you know, Iron Maiden freak. So I was learning all the Iron Maiden and then taking it into more solo classical places because I was very into Paganini and things yeah. like Ingve. Um, uh, very extreme playing. So uh, when I went to college, I was in upstate at the time. So college was in the college there was an electric bass, uh, bass guitar. It was upright only, and it was classical basically. It was okay. no jazz like in Boston or whatever. So I just got I, I just dove in the deep end because I had a band, I had a girlfriend, all this stuff. When you're, you know, just starting college, I was I wasn't ready to make the leap to New York or uh, back to the city or uh, to L.A. yet because I had too much going on, but. You know, I was raised in the city and then would travel down there and somehow ended up out here in L.A. because of just opportunities and things. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah, I was going to say, now, what what was the time frame when you moved to L.A.? When was that about? Uh, it's about half my life in New York and half my life in L.A. at this point. Um, OK. I, I, I left around uh, the mid 90s and I was about 25 then. And I've been out here about uh, 26 years now. So I've done like two, both coasts, you know, yeah. I did a lot, I did a lot of New York city and playing the clubs. Like we'd play CBGDs and there is the, uh, remember the trash bar. Oh yeah. That? Yep. It yep. was like a little simulated. They were like the future, right? They had these little speakers all around the venue and you right. plugged into a simulator and the poor drummer had to play on this little pad. <laughs> and, uh, but, but it sounded really good. Yeah. It's just the drummer suffered greatly. Yeah, well, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Don't tell Sobel I said that. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Speaking of Glenn Sobel, uh, one of the things I'm really excited about is um, I'm starting to get guests on my album now. Uh, and before Glenn went out with Alice Cooper, uh, some people get confused. The Vampires, of course, is a different band. Sure. Uh, Hollywood Vampires. But Glenn's out with Alice Cooper now. So I got him on. Uh, I wanted to get him in on this song called Violent Center, which is an old owl song from years back that everyone loved that I kind of reimagined. And Glenn slayed it. So yeah. I'm really excited about that. And he's definitely one of the best drummer, you know, one of the better drummers, period, out there. Oh, yeah. uh, and basically he's got all the feel and he's got the chops and he's got command of both and easy to work with. You, you know, know, when, when, when I was teaching at MI musicians Institute, Glenn was teaching at percussion Institute at the same oh, yeah. time. Mm -hmm. And he and I actually did a small, it was like a school tour. They like a bunch of instructors from MI went over to Japan and did a couple of weeks of touring the music schools in Japan. And Glenn was the drummer. I was the bass player. And yeah. I, I, I got to tell you, I don't, this was, you know, this was before he really broke out big, obviously. But even back then, dude, I don't remember a time that he didn't have a pair of sticks in his hand. Like at mm -hmm. breakfast in the morning, he'd be yeah. with his sticks eating breakfast. At night, like he, he was constantly working on his craft. So... You know, but that's why he's where he is right now, you know, because he, he put these. Put yeah. Yeah. It, 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 he's just got it all. Yeah. He's definitely got the whole thing. But um, I'm going to uh, put like a sample of the mix. Uh, the mix is kind of getting there. It takes some process, as you know. And, cool. Um, it's getting there. Uh, my buddy Evan's mixing it. who's done all the owl stuff and uh, some of the recent owl stuff and all my solo record stuff. And, yep. Uh, yeah. So that that's been going really smoothly, and I'll put a, a post of that up soon about Glenn being a guest on it. And the whole song and the whole release, will probably you know at this rate, the way things have changed so much for me, it's looking like next year. I thought it was going to be this year, but okay. um, to get all the art and everything in order, it's just going to be a little longer than I yeah. expected. Now this is this is going to be this will be a quote unquote Chris Weiss project, not an owl project or anything. Yeah. Like that. You. Yeah, this this should really keep the uh, well the bass players that you know are out there that are really into all these different tones and things I'm talking about where I use 
overdrive with the bow and uh, I'm doing layers of bass, for example. It's not yeah. just like one bass guitar. It's maybe a bass guitar and a couple upright bows or more. And uh, doing this piece called A Pitiful Beauty uh, on the Hollywood Vampires record. Uh, uh, it was kind of like the trigger for all this. I had so much fun creating this bow piece with like 10 bows. And it sounds like a vampire coming up out of a coffin or something. It's really spooky. And I, I love that theatrical theater of the mind stuff with sound. And, uh, so essentially, I just kind of uh, wrote this piece. Tommy got it. And Johnny named it. And uh, he called it a pitiful beauty because he had a lot of writing and storytelling on that album. So Johnny Depp titled it. And then everyone was like, that's really cool. And I'm like, wow, I should just do that, more of that, do some of that for myself. So. This record's gonna be a mix of some songs, but also maybe like a piece of music you could hear in a, a Netflix series like Lucifer or something that's kind of scary, but, cool. you know. So I'm kind of leaning into maybe some of this soundtrack sounding type of stuff, but also probably could perform a lot of it live. So that, yeah. that'll be cool. Yeah. Yeah. So Haji, um, have you had any interesting questions about gear or anything like that lately? Is anything coming up for us Ampeg fans? Uh, people are interested in the rocket base. Um, yeah. The yeah. SVT suite is uh, mm -hmm. fairly popular from the people who have discovered it. Uh, do you have a copy of that? Are you? Uh, you know, that's so cool I, I, that you brought that up. Um, I'm about to get a new, some sort of setup, some sort of a laptop on the go setup and uh, SVT suite. I mean, what else would I use, right? <laughs> exactly. Right. Did we did we send you an NFR for that, Chris? Or do you, did we get you a copy of that? I would I would love that because I'm yeah. about to get into that, and and I'm not like super engineer type or tech type, but um, as far as just tracking bass and stuff like that, it's pretty simple. So yeah. yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing all that. Everything you guys sell is basically within a a software, right? All, yeah, so the, the suite consists of the Heritage 50th, the Heritage CL. Um, the 4 Pro. The 4 Pro, yeah. And a bunch of cabs. Oh, okay. And a bunch of cool. cabs and a bunch of the, the effects pedals, the chorus, the mm -hmm. compressor, uh, the preamp. There's actually a couple of virtual pedals that there's an Octaver in there as well that's actually a really cool Octaver. So, oh, great, great. Yeah, and the Scrambler and all that. Yep, yep, yep. yeah. Well, yeah, and the SVI is in there too. So, yeah, yeah that's well, great. Yeah, that's great. That's exactly what I need. And I'm I'm going to be doing more like, you know, recording from home, so to speak, and uh, yeah. supplementing a little more of my own album. But all well, my great, tones, for, great for being out on the road too. You can just plug in your interface and sit in your motel room and go for it. Exactly. Yeah, that on the go is is pretty cool. Um, you know. Dino knows me for a long time and I've been literally recording every, everything I record has been um, uh, the old school vintage, you know, like the silver face blue line. Yep. Uh, every recording has been that all the way back to Tal Bachman. Like if you listen to Tal Bachman's record, that's an SVT. If you go to, to any of the cult, it's an SVT. Yeah. Uh, you know, any of the Ozzy I did on Undercover, everything's been SVT basically. Yeah. Everything on my, everything I've ever done. And um, basically, I'm an SVT VR guy, eight by 10. You know, yep. usually you have to have two of them just in case for backup. And, you know, you, you got it covered in a, you know, an arena. Like Gene Simmons uses one, right? Do you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. He's using a couple of different things now, but, um, right. Most part, an 810 cab and, and a head. An know? 810 cab. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, really, it, it, they're playing big stadium arenas, all that. So, it, it that does it, which is amazing. Or yeah. you could get six. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> if, you, if you look at their stage setup, I think he has like 20 per side. Yeah. But oh. <laughs> you, you know what? You know, it's funny. We had this conversation before, too. And it's like, it seems like the bigger the stage, the smaller your base rig can actually get because uh, unless you're going to put 20 cabs on each side and then at right. that point the front of house is screaming at you anyways. But yeah, like the bigger the stage, the smaller the rig. Like I, I'm pretty sure Gene has like one golden sample 810 cab that's not on the stage, that's backstage, that's mic'd. 
and then everything yeah that's what i saw yeah that's what i saw too um (laughs) yeah so like like you mentioned earlier this is the first time i'm really kind of stretching out and using active bases and i'm doing like i said i'm using these things and micing them and there's tweeters on and stuff like that so it's a little different what i'm doing for the solo album um and I really enjoy kind of the fact that, you know, I allow myself to do these different things instead of being stuck, you know, yeah. like, uh, like when we were younger, the guys that played with the pick, I remember for some reason, weren't getting any respect, even though like over half the stuff you're listening to from, you know, Pink Floyd to Led Zeppelin, you know, yeah. at least sometimes with a pick. So, yeah. you know, I, I got really into playing uh, with a pick when I joined the cult and, um, oh, you sure. know, again, the, the SVT was just, the right sound and here i am uh with the upright bass behind me yep. here, right nice and the svt sounds great again you know for everything so to me it's like that's why i've always stuck to my guns and when i was younger and dreamt of having svt stuff because yeah. that was like the holy grail or something um you know i just didn't really see any need for anything else and the yeah. versatility that i get from everything you know, be, yeah. I say it all the time between Leo Fender and and Bill Hughes and Roger Cox, the two guys that designed the SVT. It's like those those guys kind of got it right the first time. They got it right the first time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big P bass guy, as you know, although I got this jazz bass over here that I yep. found with 24 frets because, again, I'm doing going a little more. So, yeah, I wanted to I wanted to ask you, Chris, like. So, and again, you've, I've, you know, you've obviously, you've worked with, you know, some of rock's greatest guitar players, you know, from, yeah. from Ace Freely, Joe Perry. Um, I don't, can we, can we call Johnny, can we put Johnny Depp in that category right now? But I, I know he's I a great, so. guitar, he's a great guitar player. You know what I mean? Uh, but I, what he chooses to play is cool. And <laughs> that's that's what matters. Yeah. And, and the fact that he's a prolific songwriter and lyricist and singer. Um, you know, a lot of people don't maybe understand that they because they know him as an actor, but he definitely comes out very strong as it. I mean, I've been in the room with so many guys, you know, um, but and, my- and he's he's prolific. And at the end of the day, what you want is just a great song. And when he does a lead, it's a uh, a melodic one usually and then you got joe on the other side of the stage which is a little different he's got a little yeah. more fire and yeah. tommy of course which is tommy yeah. smoking just all around well, that that that's the that's kind of the question that i wanted to i wanted to ask like the dynamics just just out of the three guitar players in the hollywood vampires let alone everybody else that you've worked with the dynamics how do you change your mindset going from, okay, I'm a bass player in an outfit with three like major guitar forces to now I'm working on my solo project and I'm, you know, I'm doing all the stuff, you know, yeah. all the singing and all the playing. There's got to be kind of a change of mindset there, I would think, right? Yeah, I, I kind of, I, I get out of, the, of my kind of big rock sounding stuff and that's why I got into the smaller rig uh, the, the, uh, NS bass I got behind me playing more fretless and just sticking with the bow a lot more throughout my day. And, uh, I just change gears and start okay. listening to classical music and stuff like that. Um, I had a lot of experience playing with a lot of big, you know, superstar guitar players and stuff. I was in this outfit called Camp Freddy and now it's called, uh, something different. I haven't done it in a while, but over the years, there would be like three, four guitar players coming up. You'd have like Billy Duffy and like Steve Stevens and Slash. Yeah. And, and so uh, as a bassist, you always kind of actually, as you guys know, you kind of utilize the bite of the mid to make sure you find that sweet spot. And, uh, you know, that's part of the game there is making sure you kind of EQ wise fit in. Uh, yeah. So it's just not a muddy mess on the bottom. Yeah. But yes, shifting gears for me is easy because when I was a kid, I was like, you know, Mike Varney wrote me up in Guitar Magazine around that time of Sheehan oh, yeah. and Vi and all that. And yeah. um, then Guitar for the Practicing Musician did. And uh, that was that was really cool. I mean, I was 17. I thought I was going to be some sort of superstar back then, you know, because you get your first bit of exposure. Right. Um, but uh my nature was always almost 
very extreme bass playing at some point in the show. I, I don't like to play all over a song. I like to play the song for the yeah. song, you know. So sometimes there's no fancy bass stuff. It's just laying something down really powerfully. But um, when I was a kid, there was always, in my bands coming up, there was always a bass solo every night. And then in Owl, that's more songwriting. I always wrote the bass uh, fancy stuff in. Right. So it, it became part of the song and then people would come and see it live and often say, I had no idea that was coming from the bass or whatever. I had the recording or, you know what I mean? So that yeah. was kind of a different thing. So this is just full on going for it, you know, where there's just, it's, 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 it's kind of about all those things people don't hear all the time and getting to express it. Right. Right. Now with, with all that, Oh, sorry, Dan. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, with, with all that type of uh, shreddery background, how how did you uh, get the tall Bachman gig? Well, um, I was in a band called Lusk uh, that almost took off with Paul Demore from Tool. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the bassist of Tool and Chris Pittman that was in Guns N' Roses for quite some time. And I played, uh, I was neighbors with Chris Pittman and the guys from Tool would always hear me say, who's the guy on the upright bass next door? Because I was playing the big acoustic and, and kind of just working away so that kind of led me to lust which was like a beatles bowie acid kind of trippy psychedelic thing to being kicking around town and getting a little exposure and there was some red tape with lust and i was kind of looking for a gig again um uh no fault of my own or anything that the label had frozen up their funds for all this whatever legal reasons whatever they were going through and uh so I was free and a producer friend, uh, Michael Reed, called me up and, and said I should audition for Tal Bachman. They're having a hard time finding a guy. And I have a very John Paul Jones, you know, McCartney. I can, you know, I, I, I was a teacher for many years and had 45 students a week. And, uh, you know, so I was well versed. So what Tal wanted, I could provide. I could give him that sort of yeah. classic thing. And it was a genuine thing. I, I, it, no matter who the gig or the fame or the money or whatever, if I don't fit in, I don't care to do it. You know right. what I mean? At this, at this stage of the game, I mean, I don't really fake a gig, you know, it's, it's just, I, I would, I would hate myself if I didn't really enjoy the music and was just playing a game. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I fit in all the gigs I've done, which is cool. Mm -hmm. I think that's why I get the call or that's why they asked me to audition or whatever it was, you know? Um, yeah. And now, actually, I'm working on something different. We're actually looking for a drummer. Uh, Eric Bradley and I have started sort of an acoustic duo at this point, although we want to add a drummer. And we're doing a mixture of our original tunes, some of my owl stuff, but acoustic versions, and probably 50-50 covers where we're reimagining, reinventing sort of a, a uh, an abstract door song that you don't hear all the time or we're taking uh, a talking head song and messing with it so we're cool. gonna we're getting that going and uh, i'm i'm raring to go play live i've had enough downtime you know with two two world tours uh, canceled with the vampires you know all the international going is not not so easy yet so um two tours canceled so but I'm, I'm grateful i got some really cool things going on and uh, so once we sort out our drummer, I think I know who it's going to be. We're checking out some drummers who sing. Uh, I think I know who we're going to get. And as soon as we get that locked in place, we're going to start gigging probably here in Hollywood and New York and stuff like that. Cool. Cool. You know? right. But it's bare bones, man. I got my Martin acoustic bass and he's got yeah. his uh, Martin acoustic guitar and we're just singing and harmonizing <laughs> and trading songs. And uh, the reason why I started doing it acoustic is so I could, I could get gigging again you know, even on a smaller level, like uh, we could show up and open up for some bands in the clubs now. And I got some management that wants to help me out and so on with my solo thing and what I do live. So um, yeah, we're looking for a drummer. Uh, we might have one already, not sure yet, but we're kind of, uh, something new is gonna happen and we're gonna get out there, maybe hit the Viper Room and some, uh, some local clubs. And then when we iron it out, we'll probably make it to the East Coast. Cool, cool. You know, it, I, I got to say, you, you are the prime example, Chris, of like just guys that 
you don't wait for the phone to ring. I mean, obviously the phone rings for you because because you're in demand, but you you go, you know, and I say this to anybody, any of my students and any anybody that asks for advice is like, go out and make things happen. You know, right. create your own gig, create your own space and, and right. yours, right? Right. Uh, well, the thing is, if I don't perform and start expressing that artistic part of me, I just kind of, I'm not really working at my best, you know, I mean, my value and, and everyone, everyone's values in their work. And this has been my craft since I was just a boy, really, you know, 13, 14 year old boy. I jumped right into the songwriting part, right into the singing part and, and lyric, you know, all the lyrics. And, and um, I never wanted to go compete against anyone on the voice or anything as a singer. But I think with my Irish background, my kind of Celtic background, I grew up hearing stories delivered and, you know, I hear great singers all the time, but they're not delivering the story necessarily, you know? So um, that's my biggest goal is when I write a song that they're, you're kind of taking on a little bit of a journey or you're, you're feeling something. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that's why I do that, Dino. Thank you for that. But uh, that's why I do it. I, you know, I never, I don't really chase down gigs, you know, uh, usually people see if there's a fit or not. And then you, if there's a gel beyond that, that's kind of it, you know, yes. um, the vampires gig, uh, was, was probably more of one of the unique ones for me in the sense that that was when I took the leap and went to in-ears. Oh. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. And that was a big leap. And I thought it was all scary and all. And it turned out to be the best move ever. Because really? I was really? like, oh, this is brilliant. I can hear everything. That's why this is, <laughs> you know, and with the loud guitar player thing that you mentioned with the three guitar players, um, you know, it's, it, there's a certain kind of sonic thing that a guitar amp does. It's distorted. So it's pretty loud. And, yeah. and to be, be in between uh, Johnny and Joe, the way it was going was, Again, I, I just defined my thing a little more so it hit hard in the mix without hurting, you know, over woofing out the bottom end or whatever. And I just love that I could walk across the stage and hear everything. And, you know, honest to God, I wish I did it earlier because I know I played too hard certain shows over the years. And yeah. when you're so far away on a huge stage, there's no way you're actually going to hit it on the mark the way you would if it's right yeah. in your ear. Yeah. You know, and so that was great. And of course, I was miking up my SVT, you know, basically, yep. and uh, a little tiny bit of direct. And that was it every night. It just sounded sounded fantastic. But the in-ear thing was a really cool move. Yeah. I'd suggest them for everybody, you know. I, yeah. I just had, I had this conversation on Facebook with a buddy of mine. I, I posted a picture and he asked me, he said, are you using in-ears? And it's like, I have been for quite a while now. And I, it's the same thing, man. It's like, I don't, I do it more to protect my hearing and turn mm -hmm. volume down and be able to hear everybody playing. You know, a lot of people think, oh, I'm putting in-ears in so I can be loud and I can, it's, it's kind of just the opposite, actually. Right. It's about controlling it more for yeah. you. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, that, that. That, that was a big change for me. And, 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 you know, I think getting proper ones is good. But if you don't have money for them, just get like a cheap pair and try them yeah. out for a while and get yeah. everything going. You know? And you can still but, yeah. have your bass rig behind you. It's like a lot of people think, well, if I go with in-ears, I can't have a rig on stage. No, you absolutely can. Well, I, I did that and I liked it a lot because I, I could feel the earth moving a bit too, right? Um, right. And a couple of years ago, right around this time, I uh, chucked. Uh, Garrick from Alice Cooper uh, had a conflict and uh, his band Bisto Blanco uh, uh, had some contract or something and he needed me to fill in for uh, him and the Alice Cooper band. So I'd like learn the whole set and I flew into the UK and uh, that was a trip because those guys were using their Kempers and that was another step which I didn't know if I was going to handle it well or not. But right. I, it was actually quite cool because my in-ears were just dialed and, you know, there was no amp behind me, which was amazing. That was the first time I experienced that. So that's that's real, like, you know, modern compared to this old school kind of type yeah. of dude that I've been, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he modeled some sort of, you know, Ampeg SVT and it sounded just like it, you know, it was yeah. exactly right. You know, you know so, uh, 
it, it's it's funny because you you know this is a discussion that's that's been ongoing, and I think if if an amplifier company like Ampeg or any other amplifier company could has a crystal ball and could see into the future to to see what the actual future is going to be like for live amplifiers in the next ten or fifteen years. You know, it's, and nobody has an answer for this. Not even we don't either. Obviously, you know, as an amp company, the only thing we can offer is as many different solutions to bass players as possible. But it's it's kind of like we're at a crossroads now because you know, like you say, you're playing with somebody like Joe Perry who has you know probably 15 different amplifiers on stage for different sounds and different switches and he, he's old school he's yeah. analog old school yeah, yeah. Try, yeah. try and try and get joe to play through a kemper <laughs> well i don't know i don't know <laughs> like, he probably's tried it but uh, uh yeah there's different kinds of guys like i don't know if that's something ace fraley would do i don't know if that's something joe would do yeah um, there's different you know i don't know if that's something someone like billy duffy would actually want to do yeah. you know there's they're just used to what they're used to which which i can dig Here's the one thing with the in-ear monitors. If you don't have a proper mixer guy, it's it, you might want to just go without them. You know, that's the one thing you got to look out for, or you have to have control over it yourself. Yeah, before. yeah. yeah. A lot of times, yeah. um, like it's, at least on on my level, you know, depending on the room we're playing, if there's a front of house engineer or there's a house sound, I'll I'll because I have like the M32 app. I've got all the different apps on my phone. And I'll just say, hey, can, can I have access to my own monitor send so I can dial in what I want? And a lot right. of times they're just like, yeah, absolutely. If if I don't have to hear you saying I need more of this, this, and this, and my, I'll give you access to it. It just makes yeah. life easier for everybody. Yeah, that's that's yeah, that's that's a great thing with the uh, SVT suite, right? I mean, you can just yeah. be there and just literally run, bring your computer to the show and and use in here. This is pretty crazy. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, I got my tea here for tea time. My little right on. Owl mug. <laughs> right on. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. I go Irish uh, breakfast. I like a nice, strong, <laughs> strong tea, you know. It's got to um, taste like something. Yeah, really. It's got to taste like tea or, you know, that's I usually do the same thing here. It's like American oh, tea. Yeah, American tea compared to the English and the Irish is not proper Tea. Yeah. Um, a lot um, of it's like really weak, right? It's, it's like yeah. it's kind of like it's like for iced tea, like for sun tea out in the sun or something. Yeah, it's not the same. we've got a shop down the street here. They, they she she sells this. It's it's she sells all sorts of teas, but my favorite is the Scottish breakfast. Oh yeah, it's like and it's the loose leaves. You know, we brew it and and it's just, same kind of thing, right? The English breakfast, the Irish yeah. is kind of a stronger, yeah. You can only have one or two cups in the morning, though, because then you're bouncing off the walls because the, the caffeine content is so much more than, like, a cup of coffee. Right. It's, yeah. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Real Just tea's a, a good thing. Hint of haggis. <laughs> haggis. Right, right. Haggis. Are you guys familiar with uh, black pudding in Ireland? It's pretty popular. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. Yep. Haggis yep. and black pudding have similar spices and taste. Uh, yeah. People That's get so grossed out by that, but if you eat steak and meat, you're eating blood. So Exactly. What's hey, going on there? I mean, come to my house at Greek Easter, and we'll show you like lamb's heads and everything else on on the spit. You know, so yeah, I'm not know. afraid of that stuff. Yeah, I'm not my, afraid. My, yeah, my mom's side. We grew up on a farm, and my mom's side in Ireland and Mayo, and my dad was from uh, Waterford. So there was pig's feet in the uh, fish and chips <laughs> place next to my my dad's place in Waterford, and I remember my grandma. Uh, you know, crack the head of a turkey after I, she asked me what I wanted for dinner and I felt so bad about it, you know, <laughs> she just, just chopped the turkey's head off and uh, started plucking it right there. And, you know, that's, that's the reality of food. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. When you, I got, to... yeah, I had that great experience. I wrote some songs about that stuff too, in my owl records. And there was one song called Rover about the uh, sheep dog okay. that would run the sheep up and down the hill with my grandpa, like 90 sheep. And, I, I write about a lot of funny, quirky things if people cool. want to get into it. Yeah, owltheband.net is where that stuff is. Yep. We're kind of having a hiatus now just because it's, it's been uh, confusing with the touring and all that. But yeah. we likely could come out again. But right now I'm just working on this acoustic project so I can get to work right away as soon as I iron out the drummer. Cool. And um, 
you know, I don't know if there's a whole lot of Iron Maiden covers we could do with acoustics or whatever. But, oh, you never know. I mean, yeah, but yeah, there's maybe something. Yeah, but we're trying to we're doing kind of revamp versions or something not too far away from songs. But again, half of it's original, so I'm going to take it out a little bit live and and do some jamming and sure. Like hey, yeah. speaking of Iron Maiden, tell us about this other project that you're doing. Oh, well, again, I, we were hoping maybe for some touring and then things got a little complicated again. Um, but uh, the Smith Cotson project, uh, I, I shot a video with those guys, a song called Solar Fire. And, yep. uh, and uh, so I, I've known Richie for like 20 some years. Whatever. We, we've said a bunch of times we should get together and work together. And then right. I've known Adrian for about, I don't know, maybe uh, 12 years or so. And we've been saying like, we should do something. We should do something. And we almost started something like 10 years ago and then Maiden got super busy again. So when this Smith Cotson thing came up, uh, I was excited to get together with the guys and um, they should have more up their sleeve. I can't really divulge yeah. anything, but uh, Adrian being from one of my favorite bands, it's kind of an amazing life at times when I realized like Kiss and Iron Maiden and, sort of these people hovering around Alice Cooper and right. you know, it's kind of amazing to be a fan. But then as you grow up and become a professional, you know, you, you have a job to do. So I, I absorb all this stuff when I come home and, and it's all over usually. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. cause there was so much to do. I, I get home and I go, Oh God, I did that. You yeah. know, it's, <laughs> well, I was going to say, happened. do you, do you like, when you get home, do you like pinch yourself and go, I can't like, wow, I, that just happened today. You know? Marty Fredrickson called me once for Mick Jagger, um, and I did a, a, a session, and I, Daryl Jones wasn't available, and they were on that kind of yep. record budget producer thing that they have to do, and uh, Marty called me, and he said, hey, man, are you in town? Can you do this? And uh, I said, yeah. He said, upright bass, bass guitar, new strings, amp, bring everything. And I said, okay. Yeah. And before I hung up, I said, Marty, who's this for? And he goes, yeah, Mick Jagger, be here in 45 minutes. And I was like, whoa, you know. So uh, that was really cool. And the bass guitar, he was trying to show me off to Mick a little bit. And I remember I thought I was a bit busy. and But I did put a bow thing on top, kind of in the bridge of the song. And then they kind of used that with these cellos. And my part was the upright bass. So, uh, yeah, that, that was a really great experience. So on the way home from that, I thought I might have been his bass player because Daryl wasn't going to be available or something. He ended up doing it after that. Okay. Uh, and finishing the record. So I thought I was going to finish the record, but I got one song in with Nick. And um, I remember driving home after the session and kind of going, that happened, right? That happened. Yes, that just happened. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, you know, like I definitely have that human fan part in me still. Yeah, of and, course. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, if I like your work and all that, you know, I'm a fan. It doesn't doesn't yeah. matter to me if you're famous. Uh, but that was a special pinch moment, yes. Pinching I, I, myself moment. What was the name of the song? Do you remember what the song was? Paradise. Okay. Yeah. All right. I got I to gotta tell you, you know. That was I, years ago. That was years ago. So it's kind of a little, right. it's in the memory bank there somewhere. I got, I got to tell you a funny story about Ace. Okay, so, yeah. So, you know, anybody that knows me knows, like, Kiss was my one of my biggest early influences. Gene, Gene Simmons and Ace Frehley, the two of them together were responsible for me picking up a stringed instrument. Okay? Yeah, yeah. The whole rock and roll thing started for me, too. So I'm sitting home one night. We're watching a Red Sox game. My phone rings. It's a New York area code. And I usually, if I don't recognize the number, I don't answer it. So I, I, I gave him, I gave him your number, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, I, hello, oh, this is Dino. Yeah, Dino, this is Ace Freely. And I'm like, <laughs> so he has this, we have this conversation. He's looking for, you know, he's obviously looking for, for an SVT rig for his bass player. And unfortunately, you know, just because of supply chains and everybody that knows what's going on in the world today, right. obviously, it's like stuff is just hard to come by. So right. anyway, we have this conversation. Um, I hang up the phone and my wife is like, she's sitting right next to me. She goes, who's that? And I'm almost in tears. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That was, 
that was that that was ace and excellent <laughs> relay. <laughs> Dude, I love it. I love like, it. Did like, I tell you? Did I tell you about that? That I gave I gave the number over to Ace. Oh yeah, yeah, no? I, yeah. No. I okay, was, okay. Yeah. I, I can't remember. No, I, I, you gave me a heads up, but you know, I was yeah. like, I was expecting like his tech or management. Actually, I think his management reached out to me the the month prior, and I couldn't right. help him at that point. So, like, just out of the out of the blue, I decided to answer my phone, and it's Ace. And I yeah. the phone. I'm just. It's like, good you hey, picked it up. It was good timing. Yeah. Dude. I was just like, you know. Yeah, okay. Ace is great. Action, Ace is man. a very, very funny guy to chat with, and 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 a uh, one of a kind. Oh and, my gosh! Know, musician and person. We probably, you know Ace took care of me uh, after I had a hernia surgery. I think all the years of lugging around an SBT <laughs> caught up with me, and I needed a hernia surgery. It was like a groin hernia surgery, and um, Ace could tell I was very uncomfortable on tour, and things were starting to bother me. And, okay. Uh, and I, I've been quite physical over the years, running and yoga, and physical yeah. performances live. It just kind of caught up with me. And so basically I had to get a hernia surgery and Ace took care of me. And I stayed with him when he lived in San Diego. Um, and there was, you know, uh, kind of funny moments of me. He drove me to the hospital and back. He suggested wow. the doctor. He said, you're going to need someone to take care of you because uh, I was living up here in Hollywood. Uh, by myself in a place with a lot of stairs. So it was gonna be impossible yeah. to have stairs. So I stayed with him for like two weeks and he took care of me. And if you can imagine the, the, the big superstar Ace bringing a, a plate of penne pasta going, what are you doing getting out of bed? Stay in bed. And bringing me the, the plate of pasta, you know. <laughs> That's and a great was, impersonation too. Yeah. Gosh. Oh, I was around him a lot. and But we, we became good friends, you know, and then the vampires came up and it was a great opportunity and sort of the uh, that lineup started splintering sort of and for different sure. reasons. Uh, those guys are wonderful guys, but, you know, fans don't always last exactly. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, we all know that. But I, I did about four years with Ace and that story of him uh, helping me was really cool. And I was nervous. I never had a surgery or anything like that. And yeah. he, you know, he said, take care of my boy to the doctor. And then he came and wow. picked me up. And so having him along for that uh, gave me some confidence, probably, you know, because sure. you're kind of like, I'm going to be OK. Um, it was it was uncomfortable for sure. Oh, <laughs> but yeah. the other funny oh, yeah. part of the story was, yeah, they're not fun. Don't, you know, if you can uh, if you can avoid ripping your muscles there, don't. I had one um, earlier this year. Oh, goodness, man. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I hated being doped up because I'm kind of more uh, I'm more of an active dude. And I got really sick of the I was so glad to throw those pills away. But what was funny, Haji, was there's other memories of Ace, you know, rationing my pills because I was out of it and had surgery. And he would come and sort of monitor some of my pills and stuff, which a couple of times we just cracked up because we know the history of Ace and stuff. Right. The notion of this guy bringing me my my pills it was just the whole thing was hilarious, you know. Right. Right. So uh, I, I I'll forever uh, kind of be a buddy of Aces and stuff. It's just our wow. paths started changing a little bit, and uh, he's doing great. You know, he's doing really good, and I'm a I'm a friend and fan, and uh, so yeah, he called me and was asking me. It was okay to call you, Dino. So I'm glad you had a kick out of that. It's, yeah. okay. it's always okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's interesting things you remember about certain musicians. Like I did Undercover with Ozzy, and um, that was sort of a dream come true as well because I told my parents, you know, when I was still living in New York, we lived upstate for a while, kind of uh, Saratoga Capital District, after sure. we grew up in the city, and they're Irish immigrants, so first generation and all that. So, um, I had some time upstate, which was great because that was kind of like being in Seattle or something. It, it, the weather was, it wasn't the city and you had yeah. to create your own thing. And so what you said earlier about creating your own thing instead of waiting for a call is what us kids did. I mean, we were packing those like uh, uh, school stadiums and then we started taking it to the clubs and we would flyer. Uh, we would yeah. go to like the big con Judas Priest concert or something and flyer the whole parking lot, you know the cars and the, we worked really hard at it and we built stages. I mean, you know, if you can imagine renting out a theater, we had a good following these different bands I was in 
and uh, that's what led me you know to doing i never really planned on joining any bands you know but the ozzy thing was a dream come true and the thing i always remember about him was you could smell him he had kind of his like he had a boutique kind of scent <laughs> uh, you know he, he, had, he had the richly kingly scent you know and so I, I remember the producer asking hey, hey chris did you see it was mark hudson who said did you see ozzy yet today is he here are we gonna ready to get started and i'm like i haven't seen him yet but i can smell him because he had this really <laughs> exotic awesome scent you know it was like really Tom Ford must have made this for him or something. And <laughs> fantastic smell. It was a fantastic smell. Oh so that's God. how I always knew he was around. He was oh. really funny. That was 2004 and the record came out 2005. Okay. And um, that was Mike Borden on drums and Jerry Cantrell because I was in Jerry's band for a while and everything just wow. kind of meshed together. And now Eric Bradley and I that are working together in my new acoustic yeah. project or whatever, um, he and I were in the Jerry Cantrell band, so we did a lot of singing together. In oh, fact, cool. it was the only time I think the Allison Chains music had all three part harmonies in there. You know, because oh, they don't yeah. they have two part harmonies live. So we were doing all the, the three part harmonies. So it was a little more similar to the record. Everything sounded a lot more like the record. So sure. Eric and I just bringing him back around. Everything's connected. Wow. Uh, Eric and I go back and we've been singing together for years and we have kind of a chemistry musically and vocally yeah. together. Yeah. Awesome. But, um, and that's, I got wacko stories too, but there's, I got a lot of really good ones about people that, Oh man, I, I like to tell. See, oh, this I got a, I got a great one. Go ahead. I got a great one. If you're ready for another great bass player, uh, I'm sleeping on Jerry's couch essentially in his guest room. Like or pull out bed or whatever, and uh, basically uh, he and I were working together on a possible new band and doing his solo thing, uh, Jerry Cantrell solo stuff, and um, that was great. We did all kinds of stuff. We had another band called Cardboard Vampires and all this stuff together, but it was coming to an end because Allison Chains was going to reform. Okay, and then. Ten days later or something, Ian and Billy call me up and say, we want to get back together with you and reform. And I was like, wow, you know, crazy. But at the time, my funds were kind of like Jerry's doing Alice in Chains. And, I, you know, I end up joining the cult and we auditioned drummers. We got Tempesta. I remember okay. auditioning all these drummers. Glenn was in there, too. I thought of Glenn way back 2006, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, Trujillo called me. And this was so nice of him. I told this story maybe once. And uh, he knew I was kind of like at, at, you know, my last couple dollars, but I was about to start working again, which was great. And he said, hey, man, I know you got to buy like SVTs. You got to get like, I ended up talking to you and it, uh, it was Doc back then and getting endorsed yep. around that time fully and all that. But um, essentially Trujillo offered, he goes, look, man, I got all this stuff in the Metallica locker. I got SBTs and I got wirelesses. Remember the wireless systems, like three grand back then? Oh, oh yeah. So at the time, I, I wasn't working, so I really could use the help. And he called up and said, don't buy anything. Save your money. Wow. I got gotcha. you. So there's another nice story in the, in the rock and roll business, you know? Yeah. 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 And uh, Robert's a good guy, man. I, yeah. I, I was impressed that he was so kind. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's, and that you don't get like, that doesn't happen all the time. As kind as people are, for him to pick up the phone and say, "Right, I got you covered for gear." Yeah, and I was mean. getting close with Mike Borden, and he and Mike Borden were friends, and it was the circles of, of things at that time. And I auditioned for Metallica and all that. Yeah. So there's like this kind of like there's always just a few people in those, those circles at the end of the day. You know, there's yeah. always like a handful, yeah. handful of bass guys. I gotta kind of go up against or whatever <laughs> it always ends up just being a few guys you're like them again right you know, it's it's so funny because yeah it's like it's so cyclical you know and it, I, I mean it's just it's basically like a brotherhood you know and and like you yeah you know, gotta have subs too right these days you need a sub and you don't yeah. want a sucky sub so you, you know, things are a lot different. You don't have you don't you don't join Black Sabbath and found, find your band. It's very right. uh, different these days. Right. You, you're kind of keeping a lot of plates going. 
you know. I, I remember living in Hollywood. My my dear buddy and he's I consider him a brother of mine, Dale Titus. We would go on auditions together. He was another bass player. And <laughs> wow. We would go on auditions together because he had the pickup truck, but he didn't have a bass rig. I had an <laughs> SVT, but I didn't have a truck. Oh wow! Okay. So like, dude, if if you'll you can use my rig if you'll give me a ride to the audition with my. <laughs> <laughs> so. We you could organize it. You could organize it. You're both a group together in the auditions as well. <laughs> oh, I, I remember. I remember specifically we auditioned for Mike Nesmith, Mike Nesmith's nice. son, not Mike Nesmith, but his son, the the son of Mike, you know, from the Monkees. And we both showed up for the audition. He was like, "Well, wait a second. You guys are here at the same time." I was like, "Well, yeah. He gave me a ride because." He has my rig in his truck, and he's on. <laughs> and it's always like group people always like you guys are friends, but you're auditioning for the same gig. It's like, yeah, whoever gets it is fine. I, you know, it's right. There's no, there's no competition like that, you know. Yeah. So well, that's pretty. That's pretty interesting. I've never heard that one before. It, it's a brother, <laughs> but it's a brother. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah, we always try and help each other out as much as possible. Yeah, that's great, man. You know, like people forget the uh, those parts of the stories and. Uh, I'm always happy to tell those things about people that, you know, it's like, there's actually, you know, there's a lot of really great people here in Hollywood and, and LA and, uh, you know, there's a lot of people bag, bag on the, uh, how horrible it is here, but it's just, you know, the same kind of people are everywhere, really, you know, yeah. you always yeah. find the good people, you know? Yeah. And the, I mean, there's a lot of good people in this music industry and especially, you know, everything that's gone on in the last year and a half, two years, you know, you hear stories of, of, you know, artists keeping musicians and their crew on retainer throughout this whole pandemic. And, you know, just, just some really good heartfelt stories about people in this industry that really care about each other, you know? And, and yeah, and I, I feel like just me throwing out these new ideas and um, having uh, a lot of support for just me doing a whole new made up thing. Okay. I'm going to do a solo album, I'm gonna do something bass oriented, you know, Ampeg, sound all over this thing <laughs> you know and yeah, uh, yeah. But it's also really expressive i i, I felt like um I, I was a little nervous i'm like a solo record oh boy and then everyone took to it really well and then the artwork started developing and my concepts started visualizing and yeah uh, you know i was really surprised to see all the support because it's you know everyone's disappointed that we're not out there doing the hollywood vampires right now so i was like well check this out instead so right, it, right. you know and, and a lot of people have received it quite well so i'm gonna you know i'm pretty grateful for what's happening even though it would have been nice to do the two tours and, and yeah. stuff that was about to happen but yeah when the time's yeah. right everything will come back together and yeah, maybe right. I'll, I'll be out there quicker with my acoustic thing you know probably than anything yeah you know I mean, again, it's a prime example of, you know, okay, this isn't happening right now. So I'm going to make this happen while I'm waiting for this to happen, you know? And, and I got to, this is the funny thing I always ask everybody. Is it really a solo album? Because, or, and I don't mean this in a, in a negative way, but it's like, it's you, it's, mm -hmm. it's you and your material. You know what I mean? So this is Chris Weiss playing Chris Weiss music. Yeah, yeah. And, and I like I like kind of escaping from the formatted kind of song, uh, you know, the the chorus and the verse mm -hmm. and the chorus and the verse. This is much more like uh, escaping into real instrumental stuff, but also there's song kind of crap going on. And, uh, yeah, there's yeah. a couple of these things. One's called Saint Jude, where I'm using kind of more of a a jazz bass, a little more of the J pickup for that kind of almost like Jocko honk or whatever, that kind of mid-range fight. Yep. And um, there's some real high level of difficulty on this album where, like I said, I, I didn't, I wasn't just thumping down a groove as much as I was like really having to go over these things like classical pieces sure. and present them. And people might not realize it, but if you go in and check out the teasers on chriswise.com, you'll see that there's parts where it's bow, it's not guitar. It's like I'm playing way high up with the bow with overdrive and wah on top of the track I've kind of pieced together. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, it's it's going to be really exciting for the I think the music fan and interesting for just about anybody to listen to. Um, it's not just noodling. So it's yeah. like more, there's more composition involved, but there's some real 
difficulty level. Like, you know, I'm going to, I'm pushing it. I'm pushing it far, you know, yep. where I'm, no, I'm, 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 I'm at my peak, you know, I'm like, okay, that's about as insane as I can play, I think, you know, <laughs> but then I'm finding, I'm finding new things. I'm putting together some new things right now that are maybe more extreme where I'm going to top off the record with something like uh, a real extravaganza bass madness, you know. You but just, it's gonna have it's gonna have a songwriting, you know, a, a composition thread, but it's way off the ABC format of, of pop music. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're doing. Yeah, it's, it, you know, it, it sometimes you, you know, a lot of times we'll think to ourselves, why am I giving myself such a hard time on this sort of thing? <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's I what do that we, a lot. Yeah, we challenge ourselves. You know, we constantly push ourselves to try and yeah. do something and play something better. So. But yeah, there's a lot of times, you know, if I'm recording a part too, it's like, all right, I can do this one of two ways. I can either really make it really difficult or I can just make it really easy. Which, <laughs> which way do I want to go? Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't have to be hard. It's just about expressing those parts, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, um, and, and sometimes I just hear things in my head that are extremely fast and classically kind of oriented and then I chase them down. It's really what it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, so someone asked me recently at, 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 you know, recent years, like, well, you're already in this, these bands and stuff. Why do you do your own stuff? And I was like, because I can push myself as a singer songwriter. I'm not the lead singer of these other bands, you know? Right. Um, and also I get to utilize the upright bass in a way I want that isn't in a lot of rock music, it's just not there to simulate, you know, there's nothing there in yeah. rock, maybe Elvis, but I'm talking about like, you know, are, are like some of the rocky rockabilly acts, but I'm a little more of a classical, heavy-sided player. Yeah, so, I wouldn't consider you a rockabilly player more than no, <laughs> no. I like that technique. I've done a couple of shows where I filled in and done some of that, and uh, it's it's it, you get a sweat going, but that's not where I that's not my where I sit. You know, yeah. yeah. yeah so t keep an eye on the chriswise.com. I'm going to be posting Absolutely. some stuff soon, and if you haven't seen it yet, it, it, you're really yeah. open it up on your phone and really look at the artwork and there's there's teasers there and stuff too where you can kind of see the where i'm taking it so i hope people yeah. enjoy it it's it's gonna it's gonna be more like next year at this point but um i'm still on it and i, I plan on delivering something really special that's cool and we'll awesome. be sharing we'll be sharing it on ampeg socials too guys so anybody that's following Great. You know, always, always happy to support any, you know, any part of the Ampic family, anybody that has stuff, we're always trying to support as much as possible, too. So, um, yeah, I really look forward to it. From what I heard, <clears throat> you know, when you first shared it with me, I was like, man, this, I mean, and I mean, just just listening to it on my laptop here in the studio, but also the visual aspect from all the artwork was just like. You know, and I and I had I had showed it to my daughter, who's the tattoo artist. She was like, "Wow, this is this is like absolutely amazing." And she's, you know, she's big into the Halloween. This time of year is like really kind of her thing too. So it kind of yeah. all fits. Yeah, in. Yeah, do you remember remember in the Ace Frehley uh, bass solo I used to do every night yeah. when I was with Ace that I would do Halloween tapping and I that's right. That. <laughs> and uh, that that was uh, that was those funny things get the crowd going. You know, yeah. it, it might not be your most most intricate bit, but it's like those themes people love. You know? Right. But right. yeah, so your daughter, I got to check out some of her artwork. We'll have to kind of message each other after this. And I'll check. Yeah. It out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. She's uh, she's been doing it for, I don't know. Going on three years now. Yeah. And, um, you know, she's she's an art student. She went she, that that was our deal with her was. You want to be a tattoo artist. You got to learn the rules before you can break the rules, sort of thing. So she mm -hmm. went. She went to school for four years and got her degree and knows how to mix colors and you know more, uh, way beyond my scope of artistry, I guess. Yeah, it's a whole. Yeah, it's a whole craft. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's. Uh, be sure to check out. I think it's Smoxy Tattoo. So. Oh. Um, very but, cool. I'm tattoo free. I don't. I never figured out what I wanted. <laughs> I, don't, I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> A bass clef, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just to instill that, you know. No, I never got, I never got a tattoo. I played with the idea. Well, uh, if you if you're up this way in New Hampshire to visit, let's let. We'll Ampeg. Ampeg. No. <laughs> the whole bag. Oh, big yeah. A Ampeg logo. 
Yeah, you know, the whole yeah, the whole SBT pad on your back. Oh man, there's actually cats out there that have the Ampeg logo. There's one guy in Indiana. He's got the full old school Ampeg logo tattooed on his calf. And, uh, and, and people joke with me, they're like, how come you don't have an Ampeg tattoo, Dino, with your daughter being an artist and everything? You should have a big Ampeg tattoo. It's like, what happens if they fire me? Then what? Yeah. <laughs> or, or, or isn't it obvious already? You know what I mean? Or you bump into a drummer and he's got a shirt on that says drums. <laughs> got, I got it. I get it. But, you know, at, at some point, you know, I, I talk because I don't actually I don't have any kind of I don't have branding anywhere on my body. I don't have like Harley Davidson tattoos or Ampeg tattoos or but, you know, at some point, you know, I I will consider it because it's been such a huge part of my life. It's right. Ampeg has I would been imagine. 17 years of my life. So at some point I will get an Ampeg tattoo. I, I promise that. Just not really. <laughs> that's cool, man. <laughs> but uh, that's cool. Man, Chris, this this has been awesome, man. I'm so glad you were able to rejoin us. I know, you know. Last... I just feel like I was checking in with some friends, to be honest with you. It felt like, yeah. you know what I mean? So it was really nice to chat with you and catch you up. You're looking very trim and fit lately. That's that's cool. You're it's working out or something. It's all huh? camera magic. It's all camera it... magic. <laughs> no, you look, you, you look like you're I need you're to get that something. filter. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, Haji and Dino, thank you for this chat today. And, yeah, uh, I could do this for hours. It's yeah. great we can talk you. about a lot of things. Uh, this, yeah, I tell people, man, this is like this is the conversation that I always want to have with everybody that comes to visit at Nam, but you can't mm -hmm. have because Nam is just so crazy and everybody's getting pulled in a million different directions. So, yeah, yeah. This is it. This is the conversation that I just I want to sit down and have a conversation with everybody. You know. Yeah, I mean, you know, Ampeg's been a huge part of my life, and I I, I wear it proudly, and yep. and you know, I'm I'm using all this stuff again on the new album I'm doing, and uh, I think you guys are gonna be excited when you hear some of these yeah, tones I, I go. I'm sure we will be, and we're yeah. we're we're honored to have you as part of the family as well, Chris, especially for as long as you've been with us, and love yeah, love to have you. with you, and yeah, thank you for uh, thank you for joining us too. This has been awesome. Will you come back right. and again? Yes. Uh, yeah. Hopefully I have some, I'll have some news. I have certain things I can't share yeah. at, at, at the right times, you know, I, I will. So that's gonna, it, you know, just, uh, yeah. I think I'll be getting out there soon with my acoustic thing and yeah. keep an eye out for that. I'm not even sure what we're going to call it, but, um, and my solo album's coming along nicely. I'm going to post some of the stuff with Glenn over the next month or so and some new. Cool. If you if you make it up here to Seattle, I look forward to uh, the full 13 and a half uh, minute version of Acoustic Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner then, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're definitely doing covers. You never know. We can stick that in there. <laughs> there <you go. laughs> That's All awesome. right, guys. Cool, guys. We'll All see right. you again. Thank you. Thank you for joining in Peace, today, Chris. Buddy. All right. Bye. Hey, my pleasure, man. Mine too.